It's at the conclusion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He had these words in conclusion to say. He said, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I think Jesus' words are really straightforward, very clear, and he draws this parallel. Notice he says, when the rains come, in both situations of the house built on the stability of the rock and the house built on the sand, the rains come. And when the rains come, they shake the very foundations of the house, and depending on what the house is grounded on, largely depends on if the house survives. Jesus' point is that if you hear his words and appropriately apply them in your life, you will, in effect, be grounded. You'll be grounded from the storms of, his, of this life. There are great importance on his words, and it's a crucial promise that he makes. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at the words of Jesus, or probably better said, the words of Jesus extended through the apostles, namely the apostle Paul, and ask the question, how can we as individuals, as well as corporately as a church, be grounded upon the words of Jesus? Maybe another way to say this is, how can we be a healthy church? How do we appropriately apply the words of Scripture so that when the rains of life come, and they will, and they begin to beat down on our lives, how might we stay grounded and secure? How might we be healthy? It's a really crucial question. How do we know if a church is healthy? There are so many churches in our city, in our world. You probably drove by without even realizing it, 20, 25 churches or so on the way to church today. Uh, There are so many churches that on the outside have the pictures of health, but perhaps on the inside, they aren't healthy. And oftentimes, we evaluate churches primarily on the things that they do. They evaluated, evaluated on things like preaching style or music style or children's ministries, friendliness of the people, maybe the coffee selection, <laughs> maybe if the bathrooms have been recently cleaned. These are the things that typically people look for in a local church. And if you have those identifying marks, perhaps, that are congruent with your preferences, then you would say, well, that church is healthy. And I would submit to you that there is a much better way. Whenever we go to the doctor and we go and get a physical, we may have on the outside the visibility or the marks of health, but it's not until the doctor begins to really kind of take your vital signs and the doctor begins to apply some tests. Maybe you have something on the inside that is really bothering you, like a shaky knee or a bum shoulder, and you get a, you get a scan on that. You get an MRI, and then that imaging shows what's happening underneath the skin that is not entirely visible to the naked eye. We want to be healthy. Churches are no different. We often focus on the externals, but we may, in doing so, neglect the real marks of health. And I would submit to you that as a church... We should be about the ministry, of course. We should be about doing the healthy things that healthy churches do. But if we are not healthy on the inside, none of that really will come to matter in the end. And what really matters is if we are healthy as a church, therefore then what we do will be congruent with what Jesus wants us to do. Last thing I'll say this in regards to health. When a baby is born... One of the first things that they always say when, when you always want to know how is the baby, you don't care if he's going to go to law school or be a doctor, you just want him to be what? Healthy. Say, I praise God that I have a baby that has five, or I should say 10 fingers and 10 toes. Five toes is not healthy, I might say. <laughs> we want health. Well, 
again, just as means of introduction, uh, we will spend the next four weeks kind of looking at this disciple-making pathway that we've outlined here at Metropolitan. And just by means of review, we have four things that we submit that all of us need to be part of at any given time. And those four things are, number one, we engage with the gospel. We'll be focusing on that today. Number two, we make a real connection to the church. Number three, we have a sense of belonging with family. And number four, we serve like Christ. Now, I say that, and I just want to offer up this caveat. Pastors and church leaders and, and ministry leaders always love very simple language. And I think simple language is, in, is very helpful, and I think it's valid. And we, we like to kind of think about things in simple models that we can understand, but we also have to recognize that we're human beings, and life is not this sequential step one, step two, step three, step four to Christian maturity. Life seems to be this cyclical, circle kind of pathway. And so, let me give you an example. Some people may come to church and they find a ministry that they want to be part of, but they're far from God. They don't know anything about the gospel message. They don't know anything about what it means to be part of a church. They don't even know what it means to be a believer in Jesus. But they like serving, and so in doing so, you know, they kind of skip to like part four of our disciple-making pathway, and it's like, do not pass go, do not collect $200, you go back to the very beginning, and God uses even our service and our interactions with the local church to bring us into relationship with Him through Jesus. Life is, in many ways, kind of more like climbing up a mountain, and when you get to the peak, you can see things with clarity, but some of us are down here in the valley, and you can't see beyond the pathway of your feet. And what does it mean to have a disciple-making pathway? Well, again, this is just our desire and our way of showing what it means to be a healthy church. And so what we're going to be doing the next four weeks is looking at the church of Thessalonica. And so go ahead and turn your Bibles now to the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 17 this morning, and we're going to look at the start of this church in Thessalonica, the Thessalonian church. You may not know a whole lot about the Thessalonian church, and that's fine. The Thessalonians were, by and large, a very healthy church. The Apostle Paul wrote two letters, at least that we have record of, to this church, and he focuses primarily on their understanding of the end times and Jesus' return. There was some sort of misappropriation and false teaching that was happening, and people were being led astray. And so Paul writes these two letters largely to correct their assumptions and their convictions and understanding of Jesus' second coming. Uh, but I think that's just kind of normal pastor stuff. That's what pastors do. What is missing from these letters is calls and exhortations to be uh, in conformity to some sort of moral standard. You know, you go and you compare it, for example, to the letter of 1 Corinthians, which is a dysfunctional mess. The Apostle Paul has so much more to say about behavior in Corinth than he does in Thessalonica. And the reason why I would submit to you is that, for the most part, this is a normal healthy church. And they were anchored on the right things. They did the right things. They were about the right things. And many of that goes back to the way the church started, as we'll see in just a moment, where the apostle Paul and Silas come on their missionary journey. And the very first thing they do is they engage the culture with the good news of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And so if we are to be a healthy church, here's what you need to know today. We must engage with the gospel. Now, what that means is that we are engaged ourselves with the gospel. We interact with it. We talk about it. We reflect on it internally. And we also, in turn, engage others with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That's why we put this as step one in our disciple-making pathway. This is crucial that we get this right. And so turn with me in the book of Acts. We're going to look in Acts 17. I'm just going to read the very first four verses here and give you a picture, I think, and some idea of what's happening here in Thessalonica. In verse 1, we read this. Now, when they, this is Paul and Silas, had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary 
Here's the gospel. For the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. Okay, so let me kind of give you an idea of what's happening here. The apostle Paul and Silas are on their second missionary journey, Paul's second missionary journey. And the gospel has made inroads now into modern day Greece. And so uh, they pass through these two cities uh, because there's no synagogue. And it is Paul's customary habit to go to first, whenever he goes to a new city, he would go and he would proclaim the gospel and teach openly in the synagogue. The word synagogue in Greek literally means gather together. And the synagogues were... Uh, part of kind of just what it meant to be a Jew outside of Jerusalem, and they would gather in these synagogues for teaching, for edification, for reflection, uh, for prayer, and the sort. It was a way for them to live out their Christian life when they don't, or I should say their Jewish life, when they don't have the temple, for example, as kind of just the central locus of their faith. They gathered together. And so Paul always, as his habit, goes to these synagogues first. And the first thing that he does, we're told here by Luke, is that Paul begins to reason and begin to explain that it was absolutely necessary that Jesus come, die, and rise from the dead. Of first importance, he lays out the historical gospel truth. You don't have to turn there, but listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 5, very likely reflecting an ancient creedal confession in these words that traces itself all the way back, even prior before the time of Paul's conversion, some three years after Jesus' ascension. These are ancient, ancient words in the church. Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Number one, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. That's a reflection of an ancient creedal confession. And I love that the apostle Paul starts right there. There are a lot of things that churches can be about. We can be about mercy ministries. We can be about helping the poor or helping educate the people around us. We can help uh, in vital assistance. And churches absolutely need to be part of that. In fact, churches need to have ministries that reach out of its four walls, so to speak, of the church building and make inroads into relationships with people. But make no mistake that is grounded and founded on the fundamental conviction of the gospel message. The word gospel means good news. It's a proclamation. It's an announcement. And so if we are to be a healthy church, we better get this right. We better get the gospel right. We better have an understanding of what the scriptures actually say that the gospel is. The gospel is not your faith. The gospel is not asking Jesus in your heart. That's not even biblical language, my friends. The gospel message is a proclamation that Jesus has come to this earth as the God-man and overcome sin and death and been risen from the dead in victory and now sits at God's right hand. That's good news. And so our ministry then is not only grounded upon that, but it is shaped by that. And churches often, just like any other organization, suffer from mission creep. I heard the story about a church one time. It's, it's not really a true story. It's just kind of a little illustration. But over the uh, face of the facade of the church was this big sign that proudly proclaimed, we preach Christ crucified. And the pastor there uh, made it his point every single Sunday to proclaim Christ crucified. And that was the fundamental impetus of his message. And the ministry of the church was grounded and founded upon we preach Christ crucified. But there was a vine that was growing next to the sign. And as it just came, you know, the pastor eventually had to retire. And the baton of leadership was passed to another pastor. And along the same line of time, there was this vine that started to grow and covered up the word crucified. And the pastor, the new pastor, would say, we preach Christ. And I, I don't know exactly what that means, because that would probably mean that we preach Christ's example, or we try to live in the footsteps of Christ, which we should. But is that fundamental? 
to the ministry of church. Is that at the lowest bottom rung of the ladder? And over time, that pastor retired, and there was another pastor that came, and that vine grew a little bit more, and it was simply, we preach. And there are a lot of churches, I fear, that have bypassed or assumed the good news of the gospel because we want to get to life skills. We want to make sure people have their health, wealth, and finances in line, and we want to make sure that they have their relationships in line. And so we preach. But if all we do is preach, we are not fundamentally in line with what God would require for us as a church. In fact, I would even submit to you, if all you do is preach life skills, you're not a church. You're not. Because the fundamental purpose of the church was to extend the message of the gospel as we received, Paul says, from others. And we received the message of the gospel through the apostolic witness, through the apostles, through the original followers who were commissioned by Jesus. And Jesus gave the great commission to those apostles so that we would go and and likewise proclaim the gospel like them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so if we don't preach the gospel, we are at minimum out of balance, and we are very shaky, and we have a very shaky foundation. Paul says here that the gospel is congruent and in agreement with the Old Testament scriptures. And I love that he goes to the synagogue because he first goes to the Jewish people, as is his custom, and he begins with the Old Testament scriptures, and he begins to reason with them and to show them that it is Jesus who uh, is in agreement and fulfillment of the promises and expectations of the Old Testament. And it was not only in the Old Testament, but the the Old Testament is pregnant, if you will, with the message of grace in Jesus Christ. And so when we preach the Old Testament, we need to do this rightly. And I think it's based upon texts like this, that we preach the Old Testament in light of Christ's accomplishment of salvation on the cross and in his resurrection. We preach the Old Testament in a very Christ-centric kind of way. And again, I think there are a lot of churches that mean well, but they preach and proclaim the Old Testament, but they simply just derive moral stories and moral applications out of the Old Testament. And I would submit to you, that's not healthy preaching. That's not preaching really at all. And so what Paul does is he begins to reason with them. In fact, the word for reason is the word where we get dialogue from. And so you kind of get the picture that for three subsequent weeks, Paul is opening up the scrolls and he's saying, I want to reason with you why Jesus is the Messiah. And you see it right here. And he's doing this because he learned from other apostles, I believe, like Peter. And Peter learned this directly from Jesus. For 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus would appear occasionally to his disciples and he would open up the scriptures before he ascended into heaven. And I mean, talk about some revolutionary Bible studies as they were reading the scrolls. Oh my gosh, there you are, Jesus, right there in Isaiah 53. I didn't see that before. Oh my gosh, Psalm 110. There you are, Jesus. I didn't see it. Oh my gosh, Psalm 2. I didn't see that. There you are, Jesus. Oh my gosh, Psalm 16. There you are. Oh yeah, you were born in Bethlehem. It's congruent with the promise that was given here in the Old Testament. Over and over over and over again, Jesus opened up the scriptures and he showed how all roads eventually point to him. And so he's reasoning with them. He's dialoguing with them. And we see that there are some that agree with the apostle Paul. In fact, fall in lockstep with him and are persuaded by what he has to say. And there are some, as we'll see, that do not. Now, I want to kind of just take a little bit of a tangent. And again, as we think about what it means to be a healthy church, we need to be a church that reasons with our culture. Uh, There's just so much foolishness that's going on, I believe, in the church at large today. And how much time and hours are spent to entertaining people or coming up with the next clever, you know, series for this and that. What people really want is they they want clear talk. (laughs) They want somebody that's able to like speak and for us as a church collectively to speak into this crazy culture. And that's reflected in the numbers of people, of young people that go to church regularly and then eventually they get into their college age years and they begin to drift out the back door of the church. Now this data is pretty old. This is from 2011. This is from Barna Research. And again, I mean, that's ancient when it comes 
to data. And I think, believe that Barna has done some more data, some more research as early as 2019 on young people leaving the church. I think you'd have to do another longitudinal study after COVID to really see the impacts of March 2020 and what it's had on local churches. So take in mind that this is rather old data, but I believe it's still valid. And so when the Barna researchers would go and ask some of these young people that had now drifted out of the church, as many as 55, 65, some studies even put it as much as 80% of young people drift out of the church, they were able to kind of catalog their responses and put them under six categories of why young people were leaving the church. Number one, people, young people would report back and say that churches seem by and large overprotective. Again, this reflects the attitudes of a young person, but what this means is that they perceive that the kind of bubble that they grew up in and bubble that they have growing up in church, it was rather overprotective, and it was also seen everything that was outside of the church as bad. And so the church was designed to protect. Now, the church does need to protect our young people. I'm not saying that they don't, but this is their perspective and what led them to walk out the back door. Number two, and I think this is actually a stinging indictment for a lot of us, teens and 20-somethings' experience of Christianity is rather shallow. They don't feel like that the church really has the answers. In fact, when they brought questions, those questions were often shunned or ignored, and that the responses of, well, you just got to believe or something to the effect, there was no reasonable dialogue that they could experience in their life. Number three, the perception of young people is that churches have often come across as antagonistic and anti-science. Now, let me say that there are things in faith and science that uh, we have to think about and we have to work through, and we should just place all of our cards on the table there. But I believe, and I think you should believe this as well, that faith and science don't have to be at odds with one another. God created science. He created the world with natural laws. And so therefore, what we believe should be congruent with what we see, or better said, that what we believe should help us understand what we see. But a lot of times, young people have found that churches are anti-science, don't even want to have the conversation. Number four, young Christians, should be no surprise to anybody, church of experience related to sexuality is often simplistic and judgmental. And so we live in a very pluralistic society when it comes to sexuality and the LGBTQ plus agendas that we have all around us. And so the question then as for us as churches, how do we interact with that? How do we deal with that? Young people, this is the world they're growing up in and this is the world that they understand. And so when they find a church that is so anti that we're not going to even have conversations, they begin to, I think, rightly perceive that the church is unreasonable and they walk out the back door. Number five, they wrestle with the exclusive nature of Christianity. To say that people must believe in Christ and Christ alone for salvation, that's an exclusive, true biblical statement. But when somebody raises their hand and says, well, what about my friend who's a Buddhist? What do you say about him? Or well, what about my friend who's a Muslim? What do you say about her? And there's no real dialogue or answers to that. They begin to drift out the back door. The last reason that young people have given is that the church feels unfriendly to those who doubt. I think that sums up a lot of things. And so we've said this before, that we want to be a healthy church that dialogues, that has reasonable conversations, reasonable dialogues. One of the things I always said as a youth pastor, Matt, you model this really well in our student ministry, is students, bring your doubts, bring your questions, bring that which is troubling you, and this is a safe place to discuss that. That's a mark, I believe, of a healthy church that is grounded and founded on the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we aren't afraid of that which might be against or seemingly other from what we believe, because we believe in the truth, and we are willing to dialogue and have reasonable discourse about it. As you see here, as we continue on in verse 4, the gospel does, does demand a response. And if you're a healthy church and you declare the good news of the gospel— and there's no room for any kind of response, that is a sign, I believe, of unhealth. Because somebody has to come to a conclusion. There has to be a verdict. It is either true or it is not. And we find in Thessalonica that there were those, some devout Greeks, not a few of the leading women. Many of the devout Greeks followed Paul and Silas. But we also see in verses 5 to 9 that there are those that do not believe, and they do not 
receive, but rather they reject the gospel. So look with me at verses 5 through 9. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of his brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the city, or in the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And so you see here pretty clearly that the gospel does, in fact, cause some sort of division in the city. It's a pretty much black, white, binary, yes or no kind of response to Jesus. And what's interesting is, this, is Luke tells us that there were those that were jealous Jews, perhaps jealous of the audience that Paul was beginning to receive, the trust that he was beginning to cultivate with those in the city. And Thessalonica was a unique city in the ancient world. It had its own ability to kind of rule itself. It was a model of free city in the ancient uh, Roman Empire. And so they were able to kind of lead unencumbered in a lot of ways through like the normal Roman bureaucracy. And you, you see that reflected here. There are those that come to Jason, and Jason had harbored Paul and Silas. Now, we don't see Paul and Silas anywhere. We don't know where they went, but Jason is basically brought out to the crowd who was a legal assembly, and it is, he's essentially said, you can't do this. You can't harbor these men. And what's so interesting is the Jewish people, their accusation and things that they said against Paul was that he was preaching another king but Caesar. I mean, you catch the irony of that. These are Jewish people. I don't believe that. And they're just using the politics of the day and the fears. They were, they were saber rattling, if you will, and they were causing fear and angst in Thessalonica, saying these people are going under all the whole world, which is hyperbole, and they're causing all kinds of distress and problems. So Jason and his brothers had to put up bond money as trust so that they wouldn't harbor Paul. And then at this point, Paul and Silas have to leave the city. And you think, well, that must be kind of the sh just the, the mark, you know, that's the chapter of the church of Thessalonica. But we know that's not true because the next few weeks we'll look at some of the letters and words that Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians. Now, I want to kind of just bring us home here. And as we think about what it means to be a healthy church, I want to offer uh, several points of application. And these points of application are in your online bulletin on Church Center. So you can go take a look at those if you like. So if you'd like to take notes, great. And also after this, I should have said this at the beginning, you will be in your family groups and you will largely be discussing these points of application. So if you don't get them fully the first time around, that's okay. Our intention is that you go and really work this out with your peers and your family groups and that you talk about what it means to be a healthy gospel-centered church. Number one, our duty, if we want to be a healthy church, is that we use, again, reasonable speech. Our speech should be easy to understand. We, we, we shouldn't try to just confuse people. We should be willing to engage with those that see life from a different perspective from us. Uh, my personal opinion is that many of the big flashy things that evangelical churches have done in the last 20 or 10 years or so, I think more and more people in our culture are losing uh, a sense of appetite of that. I, I think many of the things that churches do that are like big and flashy, and I'm not going to give you examples because it sounds like I might be, you know, talking directly to maybe some churches even in our own community. I, I think that's just going to simply just kind of vanish. I, I, don't, I don't find that to be effective in the long run. Maybe it's good to kind of cultivate a, a conversation in the short run, but in the long run, if we want to be healthy, we have to know what we believe and we have to know why we believe it. And we have to be willing to engage with others that see things differently. Number two, we unashamedly point people back to the authority of the power of the Scriptures. If we are to be a gospel-centered church, we come to understand the gospel through the scriptures, and then therefore, we point people unashamedly, we don't apologize for this, we believe in the power and the authority of God's word. 
And one of the things we've always seen when those maybe come to faith in Jesus and they're very young in their faith, when they begin to read the Bible for the first time, it's like the blinders fall off and the scales fall off their eyes and things that they maybe just read or didn't really understand all of a sudden are made real. And that's exciting. It's really exciting. So we want to point people back to the authority of scriptures, of the scriptures, showing people that Jesus is really at the center. Let, let me kind of give you an example of where I think this often goes wrong. Uh, so take, for example, a common story that we would read and learn about as kids in children's Sunday school, the story of David and Goliath. I mean, like one of my favorite sports movies is the movie Hoosiers. And at the beginning, or at the beginning of their game, at the very end of the movie, you know, like Hickory High, like they're like facing against Goliath and like the local pastor or priest, I'm not sure who it was, comes in and reads from 1 Samuel chapter 17 and talks about how David picked up the stones and slayed Goliath. And so, you know, the moral application is, hey, you guys are really small and vulnerable Take those stones, fight Goliath, and win. That's usually how David and Goliath is taught. And so the impetus then is that you go all be Davids. Now, when you come back and you kind of pull above the text for a second, that is not what the story of David and Goliath is about in the least. David and Goliath is about God preserving the nation of Israel, who seemed and was very vulnerable at the time, through an appointed king, David, who was the youngest of his brothers, who had all the wrong means and methods to slay a giant like Goliath, and is God who is preserving the integrity of that nation because God is faithful to his word. And David, being the king after God's own heart, entrusts himself to the integrity and witness of God's word and lives that out. And so David really points us to the greater Messiah and the greater David who was to come, who would look down the barrel of a gun of sin and death and the giant that that was and slay it through the means of death on the execution of a cross. David is the smaller Messiah, but Jesus is the greater David. He's the greater Messiah. So what is it about? It's about Christ. And that's how we properly preach that passage Number three, we are clear on the definition of the gospel. We are clear. We use reasonable speech, but we are clear that the gospel is a proclamation. It is fundamentally good news. And so we make an announcement that what Jesus did some 2,000 years ago is still relevant today. And we also focus that the gospel indeed is what happened in real space and time And show the application of that today. And so when we say that the gospel is your faith and response, that is crippling news. Because some days you're going to doubt. And some days you're going to have really, really bad days. And if you're saved by your faith, you're saved through your faith. If you're saved by the, the expression of your faith, that is bad news. That's no more than just law rather than gospel. So we preach good news. We're clear on that. We're crystal, crystal clear Fourthly, then, our preaching has to be shaped by the gospel. And you'll notice a common word as we go forward, it's shaped. The gospel then informs our preaching. It shapes our preaching from God's word. We seek to find ways that the gospel is embodied and told and expressed in the good news of the scriptures. Number five, and this might apply to every single one of you a little more fully, Our entire ministry then is shaped by the gospel. So that goes from nursery, children's ministries, music ministries, student ministries, family groups ministries, you know, senior adult ministries, mercy ministries, care portal ministries, I mean, all the above. So what we don't do is we just say, hey, here's the gospel. And we just want to let you know, make sure that you understand that. And then let's get to the real important stuff and kind of help you. No, no, the gospel shapes it all. Because the gospel says that God loves people and loves those that are unlovable and loves those that are far from him. And the gospel also says that God loves the church and the local church. And God has proven that. Again, Romans 5, 8, while we were still yet sinners, God demonstrates his own love towards us sinners and that Christ died for us. So therefore, we also embody that. Number six, our relationships both in the church and outside of the church are then shaped by the gospel. 
So this comes with obvious applications of things I've already said, but when we see those outside of our church, we don't see them fundamentally as outsiders. We see them as the way God sees them and that God sent Jesus for them. So therefore, that shapes the way that we love those who are far from God. God loves his image bearers. He loves sinners. Therefore, we should too. But the gospel also shapes our relationships inside the church. And if I find something that often is kind of out of balance in a local church, it's this. Like, we're all about, you know, like mercy ministries and reaching people with the gospel. But sometimes we bite and devour, and we are just downright mean and antagonistic towards one another. There's gossip behind people's backs. There's backstabbing. There's politics in the church. My friends, the gospel shapes the way we love one another. The gospel shapes our relationships. The gospel says, I'm going to lay down my life for you because Jesus did that. As hard as that might be, and even when I don't want to do that, I'm going to love you as God has loved you. Let me do that for you. The gospel shapes our relationships. We'll definitely talk more about that as we go forward. Number seven, we do not stop being shaped by the gospel. So again, This is not to say that this is step one on a path, and then once we kind of finish that, then we can go to step two. We continually are engaged and engaged with the gospel through the permeation of our entire life. You'll never overcome this. You'll never move past this. And, you know, oftentimes, like, remember when I was a kid, and the pastor would come up and, like, give his gospel presentation at the end. I'm like, well, here it goes. You know, like, he's just kind of the token gospel presentation. I already know that, so let's get to the good stuff. And we all kind of feel that way, maybe sometimes in church, and it shouldn't be that way. We should never overcome the overwhelming aspect of God showing love towards us. And because we are never stopping being shaped by the gospel, we never stop being shaped by the gospel, maybe one of the things that we need to do and focus more on is the embodiment of love towards one another than always being right with one another. I think that's something that just evangelicals in general do struggle with, is that we like to be right. <laughs> and we like to prove that we are right. I'm going to say I've learned this many times as a youth pastor, and you've probably learned this as well. People don't really care what you say until they know that you care about them. <laughs> Maybe we need to focus more on that. Let me close with this, just kind of some reflections on what the late Tim Keller had to say about church. And I believe that he took this from Richard Niebuhr and kind of his positions of the church and culture. He had five categories. Keller here has four. But it becomes pretty clear, I think, what we want to be about. Keller said that churches can often just simply be in the city. They can operate and they can kind of enclose themselves almost as an island unto themselves. And there's no coming in. There's really no going out. The church is just simply in the city, and everything is designed in the church specifically for its own congregants and members in mind. Number two, he said there's another category of church, though, is the church that is hostile and against the city, where the church positions itself and looks out at the culture around it and saying, I'm going to position myself as your enemy and be antagonistic to you, and I'm going to prove to you and bludgeon you just to show you that you are wrong and I am right. Number three, you could have a church that is of the city. And what this is, is that just if you take the extreme of a church against the city, this is the example of a church that looks no different than the city. (laughs) We would all recognize places in our culture where it seems like, man, we have really flown off the rails. But when you come into a church, it looks no different You know, we pray to Mother Deity, for example, right? We don't go to the scriptures and we don't do anything that would be uh, seemingly, you know, different or hostile to the assumptions of our culture. That would be a church that is simply of the city. What we want to be, lastly, I'll say this, we want to be a church for the city. I believe that Keller is absolutely right in this. And the way that we are for the city is we are for that which God is for, namely his own glory through the gospel, and that what Jesus has accomplished and overcome, so also then we become a church that is the hands and feet and the extension of Jesus in our own church community and outside. And so we're going to explore that more fully in your family groups. We're going to explore that more fully 
in the next few weeks. But I want to close here and just pray for us as a church that we would be healthy, that we would found and be grounded upon the foundation of gospel. Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord, for the way that you help us to see things with clarity and give us great conviction for the truth of the gospel. Help us to reason appropriately so well those that are struggling with their faith, struggling with doubts. Help us to love well. Help us to love those inside the church and that that love be shaped by your love for us. And help us to love those who are outside of the church with the hope of the gospel message. And so, God, if anyone is listening to this right now, and, Father, they stand condemned under the weight of their sin and shame and guilt, we have good news for them. And that good news is that, God, you have shown and established your love towards them. And it's through the power of Jesus who died for their sins and rose again in victory over those sins and death that they can have freedom from the tyranny of guilt and have fellowship with you, and we pray in turn with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.